So I actually want to start by adding one piece to my bio that was missing there. I'm also the head of a new undergraduate degree program at the Hebrew University that I wanted, no, it's, it's not a criticism, but I wanted to add, um, in case you haven't heard of it, we have a new undergraduate degree program known as Internet and Society, Internet and Chavra, and this is a degree program that sits between computer science and the social sciences. Um, students take this program as a second major in addition to really any major at the university, and they study various aspects of the internet action and intersection between technology and society. Um, so I encourage all of you to talk to me about it, to learn more about the program, to talk to our students, we even have some of them here uh, today, and to hire them for internships and for jobs in the area. Uh, we have, as a requirement of the program, that students do an internship between their second and third years. So we have lots of brilliant and dedicated and curious and amazing students looking for jobs, most of them in the Jerusalem area. So if you are looking um, to bring somebody into your company, I, I think there's a really exciting opportunity here with students uh, with a wide range of backgrounds and interests. So whether you're looking for a data scientist or you're looking for somebody who's going to think about business or marketing, um, programming, program management, whatever it is. We have students with a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, so come talk to me about it, or um, let me know if you want to learn more. OK, so the, the starting point for my talk is the, the presumption, which I think is fairly safe, which is that uh, most of you live in this sort of modern world, and you're fully integrated in this data ecosystem where all day, every day, these amazing profiles are building, being built up about you. So as you're going about your daily business, as you're browsing the web, as you're sitting here right now, there's this profile that's being built about you. And it has all sorts of information that's being gathered and inferred about who you are, your gender, your age, where you are, where you've been, where you live, where you work, what you're interested in, how much money you have, what your health concerns are, your social connections, properties of the people who you tend to connect with, who's your family, who are your friends, who are your colleagues, what you've been buying, what you're thinking about buying, your political affiliation, your mental health status. And there's this amazing, and uh, amazing rich profile that's sort of floating above each of us right now. And this is a beautiful opportunity for anybody who wants to get a better understanding of humans, of human decision making, of how to guide decision making, um, of mistakes that we make in our decisions, of how to service better, be design better AI. There's an amazing range of opportunities here. And it's perhaps obvious at this point to most of us, but this phrase, data is the new oil, is actually literally true. There was an Economist article a couple of years back that sort of did the math and worked out data is now the world's most valuable resource. And so the companies that have managed to monetize these amazing profiles that are floating above our heads have turned this into this multi-billion dollar business. And by, through all sorts of amazing creativity and providing with us with all sorts of services and all sorts of opportunities that we really couldn't even have imagined a decade ago. And so I'd like to take a moment to think about what it is that we're getting from these profiles that are floating above our heads as we go about our daily business. Well, on the one hand, we're getting these amazing services personalized in all sorts of ways. We're getting recommendations of what movie to watch next, of which article to read next, of who to connect with, of what to buy. And it's all free, sort of. A lot of it, kind of. On the other hand, we have the opportunity to live in this amazing profiled world in which we are being discriminated against in the literal sense. Each of us is getting different services, different suggestions, different recommendations, different opportunities as we go about our daily lives, sometimes for good, 
sometimes not. Different subgroups of people are perhaps receiving fewer or worse opportunities than others, and perhaps that should give us pause. We're living in a world in which we and our friends and our neighbors, our colleagues, our fellow citizens, have these profiles floating above their heads. And so perhaps they or we or we collectively should be concerned about the ways in which this is enabling surveillance, various privacy harms. We live in the wor this world in which these amazing collections of information about us are often getting into the wrong hands for a variety of reasons. And there are all sorts of consequences from this. And we live in this world in which each of us is being actively, whether we realize it or not, manipulated on the basis of this detailed profile we carry about with us wherever we go. The choices that you think you are making voluntarily and with full understanding are no longer really yours because even the options that are being presented to you are tailored to that profile. And so we live in a world now in which we and our neighbors and our friends, our colleagues, our fellow citizens are being continually manipulated as well, which can have a disturbing effect on our ability to collectively govern ourselves. So, but we're getting all these really amazing free personalized services in exchange. And the basis of my talk is to suggest that, well, maybe we don't need to look at the balance quite this way. Maybe we don't actually need to be trading off all of these things on the left in order to be getting those things on the right. And that's the question that I'd like to explore with you today. So is this profiling really necessary in order to provide all these amazing tailored free web services? Is it necessary economically? Is it necessary technically? So let's start with the economic, that's not the area that I work in, and I think the answer is maybe even less clear there. But on the economic side, uh, there's been recent research, this is a, a headline related to an article of Alessandro Acquisti and his team at Carnegie Mellon, but there are a number of folks thinking in these directions. There's been research looking at sort of how much more valuable is advertising when it makes full use of that targeting that you can do when you know everything about where someone has been and what they're doing and what they're looking for, as opposed to just tailoring the advertising, say, to the content of the web page that they're looking at and not leveraging anything special that you know about the person. Uh, the estimates look, you know, maybe it's 6% more valuable. Now, this isn't the last word in this space, but it certainly should give us pause um, and encourage us to look look a little bit more carefully what's going on here. But that's actually not the direction I want to go in. The direction I want to go in is I want to look at, is this sort of pro profiling really technically necessary for us to receive these amazing tailored services that we receive? And in order to look at that question, I want to give you a literal cartoon of this uh, sort of machine learning data-driven environment that we live in. Yes, I, I know here. I don't know if what you're laughing at is the same thing that I find, find funny, but I find quite funny to have my bad handwriting magnified to this scale. Um, so, so I want to give you this cartoon of this ecosystem that we live with, and then I want to look at it piece by piece um, and see what maybe we should be concerned about and whether or not we can allay some of those concerns with modern technologies. Okay. So the world we're looking at here is one in which there's some platform, some company in that cloud in the middle, and what they want to do is they want to learn some sort of, say, recommendation algorithm. You can generalize this. And what do I mean by a recommendation algorithm? I mean something that takes in detailed information about somebody, their habits, their you know, characteristics, whatever it is, and spits out a suggestion for them. Think of it as a suggestion of the news item they should look at next, or the product they should buy, or what, whatever it is, the way they should drive. But takes in some details about you, produces a suggestion. We're all familiar with this sort of thing. OK, so we have a company that wants to produce a recommendation algorithm. And here on the left-hand side, what do they have to do? Well, in order to 
produce a recommendation algorithm, they got to train on something. So they need a bunch of data about different people and what they've done in the past, you know, what their characteristics were and what they actually read or what their characteristics were, or what they actually bought, whatever it is. And so now we have this system that is making rich use of these profiles that are above people's heads. And it's making use of it in a couple of different ways. First of all, we're gathering a huge amount of information in order to train our algorithm. And second of all, we're gathering a huge amount of information about people in order to deliver our recommendation to those individuals. Okay, and we might be concerned that people are having to hand over data in order to train. We might be concerned that the trained recommendation system maybe somehow dangerously encodes personal information from the training set. And we might be also concerned that somebody actually has to hand over their details to the recommendation algorithm to get the recommendation itself. And so what I'd like to do is to sort of hint to a variety of technologies, each of which has really only come to sort of the realm of feasibility in the past decade or so, and often even more recently, they call into question this necessity of various pieces of this architecture in order to achieve our goals here. Okay? So the first thing that I want to point to, so I'm going to remove any implicating names from that cloud. That's just whatever that company is that's trying to, to train a machine learning algorithm. The first technology that I want to look at is known as differential privacy. Uh, this comes out of work of Dwork, McSherry, Nassim, and Smith from 2006. And basically, the, the idea here is to call into question whether or not we really needed a lot of detail about each person in the training set, so long as we had a lot of data. The intuition that's being leveraged here is that when you train an algorithm, you're looking to extract general properties of the underlying data distribution. You don't really want to know whether Katrina surfed to this particular page on this particular date and clicked in this particular place. That, that shouldn't be encoded in your algorithm. At some level, that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for general trends, correlations, fundamental properties. And so it sort of makes sense at some fundamental level that it ought to be possible to add a fairly large amount of noise to each individual's data or in some sense to the training process and still maintain the underlying properties that you want it to maintain. And so differential privacy is, is a property of anything that sort of run on a database of people's information or, or actual people's sort of individual inputs and restricts you in some way to produce an output that is essentially the same as what you would have gotten had you removed or perturbed any one person's data. That's the intuition here. So differential privacy says that in order to protect people's privacy, the behaviors that you should have should not be very dependent on any one person's data. And that also sounds like good science, right? I mean, if, if you do a study and the results change substantially depending on whether or not one person showed up or didn't in the lab on that particular day, you're probably not doing good science. Similarly, if you're doing machine learning and what you get out would behave completely differently had I added or removed a single data point from my training, that's also suspect, right? And what differential privacy is, says is that sort of robustness is not just good science, it's also good privacy. Um, and so there's actually a very rich toolkit now, um, this is a space that I work in myself, that basically takes a wide variety of tasks that you might want to run on data and shows how you can do them in a differentially private way by sort of adding noise at various stages the, of the process. And so basically, whatever machine learning you are in, you were interested in doing, there's a good chance that you can probably do just about the same thing, maybe with a bit more data, in a differentially private way. And so you can potentially get rid of this sort of first questionable thing either by having individuals perturb their data before they hand it over for training purposes, or you can maybe get rid of the second questionable thing by making the centralized platform add some noise to its learning process to pr produce the recommendation algorithm. So we can either get rid of this sort of concern that 
we had to, to hand over unadulterated data to the platform, or you can get rid of this concern that maybe the recommendation algorithm somehow encodes too much individual data. Okay, so that's the, the first sort of thing that maybe we can fix in this system using new technologies. The, the second thing that I want to call into question is the idea that we needed a centralized platform in the first place. Um, and here the sort of relevant toolkit is, goes under the, the name of multi-party computation or SMC. Um, and here the, Id the idea is that there's a, a suite of cryptographic tools which are sort of coming into their own um, and getting, getting to the stage of being deployable uh, that allow you to take a system where you rely on having a centralized trusted server and to replace that centralized trusted server with a more distributed format where there you, need, you need much less trust in the system. So for example, instead of needing to all hand our data over to one server, uh, the multi-party computation version of this might be that each of us hands something that looks like noise to each of a couple of different servers and well, as long as they don't all get together and collude, then each of them can sort of do their piece of the computation that looks like garbage, but when they put the results together, we still get out the, the correct answer. And so this enables to do the us to do the computation that we wanted to, to do without needing to entrust anybody with sort of the intermediate information or the, or the data that they needed as the inputs to the computation. And so here there's again sort of a suite of tools um, so that's, that's potentially getting rid of another questionable or uh, frightening piece of this architecture. And then the last piece of the architecture that maybe is still making us nervous, okay, fine, we somehow generated a cool recommendation algorithm, but now we have to deploy it. In order to deploy it, we need people's data. If I'm gonna tell you what piece of news to look at next, I kinda need to know something about you. If I'm gonna tell you where to drive, you need to know where you're coming from and where you're going, right? And here there are, there are a number of technologies that let us call this into question. So sort of going under the, the general heading of local or encrypted computation. And so one of the ideas is sort of the obvious one that sometimes instead of you handing me your data, I can hand you the recommendation algorithm. Why don't you run it on your phone, on your own data? Um, that's sometimes a possibility. Another sort of class of possibilities is well, don't hand me your data. Hand me an encrypted version of the data that I can't encrypt. I can, in certain, uh, in certain implementations, I can compute on that encrypted data and come up with an encrypted recommendation for you. I, as the curator, have no idea what this encrypted recommendation means, but I can hand it back to you and you can make sense of it on your own device. So there's the potential to deliver the recommendations that we wanted to deliver without needing to violate the privacy of the individuals to whom we're delivering the recommendations. So now you see we sort of have this whole system that had all of these concerns that was relying on what felt these critical ways on these profiles that we're all caring about. But in many cases, we can deliver the same products, we can deliver the same services without needing these profiles to have all of these negative consequences. So I'm guessing many of you have encountered some of these technologies in various formats at various times, uh, but I really want to push here the, the perspective that um, any time you're working in a space where you're dealing with individual data, you should think hard about what, it, what do we really need um, from the data and how can we deliver it with the minimum harms to individuals and to society? And so to return to that sort of equation that we had before, so uh, there's sort of this question of whether or not there is this trade-off that we had before, but there's certainly, uh, there's certainly other reasons why companies are interested in those profiles um, and, and not necessarily clamoring to implement all of these new technologies. There's costs to implementation, there's sort of costs to change, and there are also a number of other potential benefits to being data dominant in various ways. Um, but I'd like to invite all of you as technologists 
uh, to think about whether it's time that we collectively replace our data ecosystem model um, and what, what could potentially be in its place and what are the ways that we could change incentives both at the local and sort of at the global level um, so that we don't have to face these kinds of trade-offs because I think people have come to accept these trade-offs as inevitable. If I want those amazing, cool, personalized free services, of course I have to click accept and there are the consequences, be, be they what they are. And that's not really the world that we have to live in. Um, and we all collectively have an ability, I think, to really change the world. Um, and maybe it's too late, but I'm an optimist. Maybe we can do it together. Thanks. Great question. So the question was, um, in the context of differential privacy, I mentioned that in many cases you can do the same sort of machine learning that you could have done without privacy, but you might need more data. Um, and how much more data is going to depend on the task at hand? There are certain uh, classes of tasks uh, where we're talking asymptotically the same amount of data, practically um, still factors larger often. Um, in other cases, it, it's a worse trade-off. Uh, but it's worth looking at closely because at once you're getting into the space where you have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data points, um, which hopefully many of you are, um, given the types of things that I suspect you're doing with data, um, then it becomes potentially realistically practical to be deploying, deploying these types of algorithms. Of course, the sort of hidden question on all of this is, well, what is the privacy guarantee? Because it turns out in all of these algorithms, there's sort of a knob that you can turn, and you can get more privacy and less accuracy as you turn that knob. Or you can think of that knob as also going between privacy and data. You can you know, get more privacy, but you're going to need more data for it. And there's a societal question to be answered that the math doesn't really answer for us, which is sort of how much privacy for this particular notion, mathematical notion of privacy, how much privacy is sufficient for this particular application. Uh, but I invite all of you as sort of tech-minded people to start to engage with those questions because I think it's really important that we have a, a formal and rigorous way of thinking about these real societal problems. Yeah, so I, so, I, so I love that you, you pulled out the, the manipulation concern. And so the, to, to, if I can summarize, uh, you said, okay, we solved privacy here, um, so we can deliver you with tailored recommendations without violating your privacy, but we're still delivering you with tailored recommendations, and so you can live in your filter bubble if you want to, and you can only see things that you know, pertain to people like you and that people like you see, and that's still a real and, and meaningful problem. Um, Yes, I think we need an intervention not only in the privacy direction, but also in the delivery of services direction. And I do not have time to go into it, but I do have a research agenda that focuses on addressing that aspect of things. And I'll just, to give a hint, I think that an essential component actually of both pieces of the problem is that we need collective representation of individuals that will let us I protect ourselves and protect our society, both in what's gathered and in what's delivered to us. Yeah, it's an important point. It doesn't. There, there's a mystery here. No, I, you're, you're absolutely right. There is a mystery here. It is. I think they're both wrong. Um, I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. But I think that we collectively are, are betting on data beyond its ability to, to target advertising. Um, and that may not be wrong um, because the greatest things we can do with data we haven't even thought of yet. But there's, there's, something, there's something that should make you think twice about those two things side by side. You're absolutely right. Something's wrong in this picture, and I can't tell you exactly what. Thank you.